This is a new class for me. I, I've never really taught this class before. Um, I've had classes in forensic psychology. Uh, ugh, I've worked with forensic psychology from time to time, unfortunately. It's not a lot. Um, I've done uh, forensics before uh, when I worked in the laboratory. Uh, but I've never really actually taught this class. Uh, I, I was surprised. I had never heard of psychology and law, but this is a fairly good textbook, so hopefully we'll wander through this together. Uh, but one of the reasons I wanted you to do article critiques is so that we could find out what's happening right now as far as uh, psychology and law is concerned. So I looked at uh, some of the themes of, of the uh, chapters, and I've given you keywords to, to use uh, when you're looking for an article. Um, Sarah's a hero. I, I've said that over, I said that last year. She's even more of a hero now uh, because she has induced the, the library to get psych articles and psych info. And psych articles and psych info uh, are APA uh, uh, journals uh, and APA, uh, any in APA information. Uh, it's the premier um, database for uh, psychology. Uh, uh, psychology journals and, and psychology or articles. So how do you get to psych articles? <clears throat> you uh, go to the library website, click on the library website. Uh, you click on uh, research, research something. I can't remember what else it says. Oh, you're here. Just <clears throat> That's about as much of you as I can take in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, you click on research. Uh, it's not right there. If, if you look at that, the next uh, the next uh, page, it's not there. You have to scroll all the way down to the bottom. It says psychology, and then you'll see psych articles and psych info. You can use either one: psych articles or psych info. Psych articles are just journal articles. Uh, psych info is everything. So it's not only the journals, but also books and uh, other other materials potentially. So that's how you find uh, psych articles and psych info. Um, I checked out all of these keywords to make sure there was some information about them. You wouldn't think there would be that much about crime or juries, but there is. Actually, there are articles about juries and whatnot. Uh, so that's what I want you to do. When you, uh, I, I give you, an, I explain to you what uh, what information I'm looking for with my. Uh, article critiques. We did this in physiological psych, uh, so those of you who are in physical, physiological psych have already done the uh, article critiques, uh, but it, it gives you a, uh, a template as to what information I'm looking for. So there you go. I don't remember why I'm filming it. Oh, for you. I'm filming it for you. Okay. <laughs> I remember now. I know where I am. <laughs> Barely. I kind of know where I am. Okay, so yeah, I, I was I started going through this uh, this textbook uh, over the summer. I uh, had a real traumatic summer, as, as I told everybody. I had a real traumatic dream last night where I lost my pants and I was wandering around <laughs> campus, <laughs> try, trying to find my classroom, but I couldn't find it. It's really kind of weird. You ask yourself, how in the world did you lose your pants? I have no idea. One second they were there, and the next second they were gone. And here I am walking around camp. This is my dream. I ended up on a balcony somewhere. Like there were any balconies. It wasn't this campus, it was another campus. Anyway. Okay. So I was a little traumatized by my dream. I really was. I, I was really traumatized by my dream last night. We have filled up all the seats. So if anybody else shows up, I'll give you a final to share. We're going to steal one from another one. This is exciting. Okay. okay, so there will be a five page paper on anything in the textbook, any topic that you care to deal with. Uh, I witnessed uh, I, at, at uh, the, the conference, I attended a conference in Vancouver over the summer, actually it was at the end of July, and one of the um, uh, keynote speakers was a lady by the name of Loftus. She's out of uh, a, uh, the uh, banana slugs, which are which the, the University of California Santa Clara, I think they're the banana slugs. 
anyway, she is one of the premier um, researchers dealing with eyewitness accounts. Uh, and one of the things that we know, uh, she, she is a member of a team called Project, uh, Project what? Anyway, they get people out of prison who shouldn't be in prison. People that were convicted on, uh, on inaccurate uh, evidence. Uh, I can't remember, Project something or other. Anyway, uh, her name's Loftus. Fascinating, it was a fascinating talk. Uh, she, she gave us all kinds of interesting statistics about how frequently eyewitnesses uh, are inaccurate, how they don't see what they think that they see. Uh, one of the things that happens to us, if something traumatic happened in the room right now, we would all be ducking down and we would all see different things. Potentially we would all see different things. It would all have to do with uh, your perspective. Everybody has a, a different perspective. So when this eyewitness uh, is, uh, is uh, being uh, questioned at a trial, uh, one of the things that happens is they try to guide them in, in a specific way. And of course, sometimes it's totally inaccurate. We can implant inaccurate information uh, into your brains. We can, uh, law lawyers can do that, psychologists can do that. People that, that talk to you uh, can potentially uh, convince you that, that you've seen something that you haven't seen yet. How are we doing? Oh, all those. <laughs> the dead heads in the back of the room? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was just talking about Brian. <laughs> oh, stop picking on Brian today. It's Jeff's day to pick on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so how are we going to pass this thing? Uh, it's okay. Article critiques, we have the five-page paper. There are, th there are going to be three tests. I haven't made them up yet. Uh, and, uh, okay. and that's it. That's it. So just the test, the paper, and the uh, article critiques on each chapter. So potentially, we have a select amount of information from the textbook. Uh, you, with your article critiques, we'll be getting new information about that, about that chapter. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So not only will we have the the uh, pat information that we get out of the textbook. And this is what, the, like the 8th edition or 7th edition. So potentially some of this uh, information in the textbook is dated to some extent, but of course we're going to be updating the information that we have with your, uh, with your article critiques. Should be fascinating for us if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know why. I don't know why Sarah put this on the schedule. I'm, I'm a little surprised. Uh, I would have, uh, see, we're, we're, we're one chair short, and it's your fault. So we have to go find a chair. I'll be right back. I'm going to go steal a chair for something. I'll be right back. You may not remember this uh, this incident, um, but uh, it was like it was like a midnight showing of of uh, the Dark Knight Rises, and it was in Aurora, Colorado. My son lived in the town right next Littleton. It's not really a town. Denver is this big spread out place. So Aurora is down in the southern section of uh, of Denver, if I'm not mistaken. 
Wait a minute, somebody has lived in Denver. Right, you lived in Denver, didn't you? Did you live in Aurora? Uh, I was uh, north of Denver. Oh, so you were north, okay. And my son was right on the southern edge of what is Denver, I guess. So he was in Littleton, right there. I guess Aurora's right next door. Anyway, uh, so this is, he went, this guy went into a theater. theater. This is how he was dressed. And these are the weapons that he took into the uh, into the theater. <clears throat> he was able to reload many, many times, several times. Uh, he he took like uh, 90 shots and he hit people. You can see he, he wounded 60 people and he killed 12. That's uh, 72, I hope, if I could add and subtract. Uh, so out of 90 shots, he hit people 72 times. But then again, he's got a whole theater full of people, and he's just blasting away. Uh, and he's got some fairly easy, relatively easy targets. He only killed 12. As confusing as that is, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, he had a shotgun. And I think he was using the shotgun initially, and then he went to the... Uh, the uh, the MP15, uh, MP which is uh, the old uh, uh, AR-15. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like the AR-15, which is like the M16, except it's a mm -hmm. better version of the M16, the one they gave the, uh, the, the soldiers. Anyway, then he had a pistol as well. But I don't think he pulled the pistol, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, he's blasting away with his shotgun, threw his shotgun down, and uh, started blasting away with his, his MP15. What's the caliber on that side? Uh, 2.23. Yeah, it's the same as the mil it's a military rifle. Anyway, <clears throat> that's what he looked like coming into the theater. People saw him and thought he was part of the show <laughs> because it's the Dark Knight, Knight races. It was Batman, you know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, why did he do it? Uh, he was a PhD student, not to say all PhD students go insane and start blasting their head people. But uh, he was a PhD student. He had actually dropped out of his program. Uh, why did he go in? Well, we're not exactly sure why. Um, uh, he had withdrawn from his, his PhD program. Uh, he had uh, harbored psychopathic traits uh, that went undetected by people who knew him. So he was psychopathic to some extent. But the reality is we see odd people all the time in this room. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we see people, odd people all the time that you think, maybe this guy's a little, just a little off, just a little off. Will he go in into a theater and try, start blasting away with an AP-15? Uh, well, most people that we think are strange don't, right? I hope. Okay. You know. Who's the most dangerous person in this room? You? <laughs> no. Who's the most dangerous person in this room? It's probably not a person, but... Not a person that the camera's the most... <laughs> the most dangerous person in this room is me. I'm the most dangerous person in this room. Why? Well, if we look at all the, the mass murderers, if we look at all the serial killers, what race are they? They're not native? White. white. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they're white people. So the most dangerous person in this room is me. Of course, I don't have a weapon, so I'm not dangerous at all. But Isn't it also because you're a person of authority as well? People of authority? Like, because you're our teacher, so you're a kind of like an authority figure over us? I don't know. Do, do I scare you? <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Well, authority also, figures are, are more dangerous than, than, no, I would say the other, it's the other way around. Okay. I would say it's it's the subordinates because they're the ones that probably get pissed off and are more likely to start blasting away. So, yeah. Except you're the wrong race. Sorry about that. I'm the dangerous guy in this room because I am uh, of the race that, I don't know what's wrong with white people. I don't know why they start blowing people away like that. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Is it the, our Viking heritage? We go berserk and, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Wait a minute. So I went, okay. So did we figure this thing out? Yeah, he was psychopathic. And, and now that he's shot all these people, uh, psychologists are going, sure, I would have recognized that right off the bat. Would you have recognized the fact that he's going to go into a theater and shoot people? Probably not. 
Psychologists, just like everybody else, uh, try to think in the positive, try to think more positively, so they don't they don't read scenarios in, in a negative manner. Would somebody have stopped him? Well, if they, of course, if they had known, if he had said anything about shooting people, they probably would have been able to stop it. But just by looking at his psychopathic tendencies, no, we would think more positively about about Mr. Holmes, who has been convicted now. I think. I think they gave him life. Isn't that what happened? I, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure. Law in Arizona allowed police to stop anyone who sus they suspected of being an illegal immigrant. This is the law in Arizona. Some, some of you may have been stopped. Why? Well, Hispanics are, have native ancestry. They are relatively dark complexion. Therefore, if you see somebody with black hair and a darker complexion than white, it's white. I don't know. You could the police can stop you just because you're not white. It's a law. They can do that. Uh, there are there will be no national championships in Arizona because of this law. People are really upset about it. The uh, National Football League really upset about this. Uh, the NBA really upset about this. Major League Baseball they'll never hold an All Star game in Chase Field, I think that's the field in, in uh, Phoenix, because of this law. <clears throat> as confusing as that is. Research indicates that Hispanic residents of Arizona are now less likely to report crimes for fear that they will be harassed by the police. So they're afraid to call in the cops. Uh, they were talking about this on the news the other night. Uh, kids in school are afraid to come in kind or to, to go to the teacher and, and request anything because they're afraid that she will file something and potentially they will go to their house and if they've got relatives who are not legal here, they, the, the kids probably are legal because they were probably born in the United States. But they may have a parent who came across the border illegally, as strange as that is. Uh, so in Arizona, this is really kind of a really serious situation, as we say. Okay. And maybe you guys have, have come in contact with this problem. Mainly because if you can see inside a car, and I don't know if you can see inside cars anymore, can you identify somebody's race by looking in their car? They don't have their window rolled down. Aren't the windows kind of tinted so everybody looks about the same? Yeah? No? I don't know. I've been stopped as a native. In, this is in Montana because I had a uh, dream catcher hanging from my, my mirror. So they stopped me. And I had a Fort Belknap college license plate. So they stopped me. When he found out that I was white, he said, oh, sorry, I didn't. He, he gave me some excuse as to why he stopped me. <clears throat> You're not native at all. I don't know. Strange stuff. OK. Anyway, so Arizona. After a 10-year-old was killed by a drunk driver, the driver was sentenced to 180 days in jail over the next 10 years. This is in the Northeast. Uh, they had to go to jail on Christmas Day. They had to go to jail on New Year's Day. They had to go to jail on June 8th, the child's birthday, just so that they would realize, they would understand, they would reflect, reflect on how the child's family uh, ha ha were, were feeling about their loss, as odd as that may seem. Can a judge do that? He can tell you what days you have to go to jail? Of course he can. He can do anything. They can do anything that they want. I, I say he. He could also be a female judge. Uh, laws as human creations. Laws are human creations that evolve out of the needs uh, for order and consistency. Laws regulate our private lives and our public actions. Our laws change with the needs of society. So when, when society changes, laws change. And of course, people, then you get all kinds of of people complaining. Uh, this is a real controversial uh, subject right, right now because there are people out there that are screaming about their Second Amendment rights. So do you have a right, do you have a right to carry a gun in a, in a school? Or is it too dangerous to have guns in school? Should I be carrying a sidearm right now just in case Lane decides to shoot the place up? <laughs> Again. <laughs> Why do you think she's here instead of that? <laughs> but the, the uh, Secretary of Education, uh, what is it, DeVos, uh, Betsy DeVos? You know Betsy. Uh, okay. 
she, she wants to put guns in school. <clears throat> Do you remember the reason she gave for putting guns in school? Really because of bears, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in Wyoming, they had a bear that came to a school or something. If they'd had a gun, they could have shot him. But uh, since uh, guns weren't, aren't, aren't legal, I guess, around school zones. Personally, I would rather not have guns in school. I don't, I don't certainly don't need to carry one. But uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that you guys need to be carrying guns either. Uh, Johnny might get mad at me and just, you know, start plugging away. <laughs> <laughs> On tape. <laughs> uh, one time, I, I, I probably told you this story before, but when I was at Ashford, I was driving home one night, it's like 5.30 at night, I'm late, my wife, every time I'm late coming home from work, my wife kills me. I, I, and I mean that literally. She, she imagines that I've had a wreck and that I'm dead sometimes. <laughs> and she does this every time. Anytime I said that I'll be home at 5 and I'm 15 minutes late, she, she kill, starts killing me off about 5 minutes after I should have been there. Anyway, so I was driving home from Ashford and it was raining. And I pulled out my little, my little sports car. I had another sports car at that time. So, you know, it's about this tall. <laughs> Anyway, I pulled out in my little sports car and I'm driving up the road and I passed this guy and I could see that he was carrying a rifle and it was looked like a military rifle. I could see the barrel hanging out of his jacket. I could see the butt of the rifle right here. It was hanging out of his jacket and it looked like a military rifle and I was thinking. And he had a mean look on his face. It's a, a kid about 18, 19 years old. 17, 18, 19. Who knows? You know, all teenagers look alike, don't they? His hair's all plastered down. He's walking in the rain. He's got this mean look on his face. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. He's got a gun. <laughs> this guy's got a gun and he's walking right towards school. It was only, it was only about 100 yards from school. And uh, one of the things I thought was, no, can't be a gun. He's not going to hurt anybody. And then I'm driving up the road and I'm thinking, well, what if it is a gun? What if it is a rifle? It sure looked like a rifle. That sure looked like a barrel. That sure looked like the butt of a rifle. And then I was thinking, well, if it is a rifle, maybe he's got a girlfriend or something at the college and he's going to try to find her and kill her. There was a dorm right there on the road. So potentially he could have shot all the windows out. Potentially he could do that. Or he could have gone on campus. I mean, there was a security guard there, but you know, he could have walked onto campus without going anywhere close to the security guard. And so I drove up the road and I'm thinking, well, you know, if he does shoot up the school, whose fault is it? Well, it's his, of course, but if I saw him and I identified what he was carrying, and it actually was what I thought it might have been, then it's my fault too, right? So what I did, well, I turned around and came back. <clears throat> I came back. <laughs> And I'm thinking the whole time, well, how, how am I going to take him down? He's, he's bigger than everybody's bigger than I am. My God, how am I going to take this guy down? So I decided what I was going to do if, he, if, if I see him aiming the rifle that I was going to ram him with my car. Of course, my car would have hit him right about his calf. You know, <laughs> My car would have bounced off of him. Just stood there. <coughs> Got a little car. Anyway, that's what I decided that would do. And as I was, as I was coming back uh, to school to find this guy, um, I saw him getting into a car. He was screaming at somebody, you know, shaking his finger. And it was a rifle. It was a rifle. And he had it turned upside down, just like you're supposed to. You know, you can't get water in the barrel. You don't want to get water in the barrel. Anyway, it was a, it was a weapon. Um, and he was getting in a car. An, an old Chevy, an old red Chevy. Anyway. So, yeah. So did I do the right thing? Did I do the wrong thing? That's one of the reasons why I don't think we need guns at school. Uh, that's one of the things that we can say, no guns at school. If you see, see somebody with a weapon, if he had stood on the sidewalk, uh, on the other side of the school, and I'd called the police, the police wouldn't have arrested him because he can, I mean, you can carry a gun around, right? It's a rifle, you can carry a rifle around. Can't you? I think you can anyway. Wow, okay, so 
Yes, he had a rifle, and no, but no, he wasn't going to shoot any. I don't know. Maybe he's going to shoot his sister. Maybe that was his sister. He sure was pissed off when he got into the car. He's just screaming at her, shaking his finger. It was a gun. Okay, so weapons are banned in school grounds uh, around the United States. Uh, uh, does that include Ashford University in Clinton, Iowa? Yeah, yeah, probably it does. Uh, most of the mass killings uh, of the last decade, our laws now prohibit weapons at school because of that. We have had lots of school shootings. Uh, we had a school shooting in northern, at northern Illinois. Of course, we had the one at, uh, at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, the, the mass killing at uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, we've had uh, the shooting at Newtown where the, the guy went in and, and shot all those first graders. As, well, who wants to shoot first graders? Well, obviously he did. Uh, we had a shooting up on the Red Lake uh, Reservation in uh, Minnesota. It's in Minnesota, yeah, Red Lake. Um, lots of shootings. Lots of, uh, of kids have been uh, killed in school, as confusing as that is. Okay. <clears throat> laws help resolve uh, conflict and protect the public. Uh, laws resolve the conflicts between one person's impulses and other people's <coughs> rights. So if you have an impulse, and you guys are leaving. All right. Oh, this is perfect. Now we have two empty chairs. <laughs> Did you, do you guys got everything straightened out with Sarah and everything? Okay, good. All right. Anyway, okay. So uh, people do have impulses, and some of their impulses are negative impulses. They want to hurt somebody. They want to punch somebody. I've wanted to punch people before. I've wanted to punch my spouse before. Not this spouse, but my first spouse. <laughs> I wanted this to punch. I didn't, but I wanted to. One, well, you know the story about when she stabbed me that one night. Oh, she stabbed me. She'd already stabbed me earlier in the day, and here she stabs me in the chest. I'm asleep, and she stabs me in the chest. Johnny thinks it's funny. <laughs> she stabbed me right over my heart. I know exactly where my heart is, okay? She stabbed me right over my heart. I wanted to hit her. That was my first impulse, was to, to protect myself. By making her stop stabbing me. Uh, but I didn't. But I did take the knife away from her. Here's a stupid thing that I did. I put it under my pillow. Like that's gonna <laughs> like that's going to protect me. It was a steak knife. Do you know how many knives we had in that house? Here I took the one knife that she stabbed me with, put it under my pillow as if that's the only knife she could possibly use. We had butcher knives and, and cleavers and all kinds of knives in the kitchen, and I'm thinking, well I've done something. Yeah, all right. But my impulse was, was to hurt her, or to make her stop. And it was, it was to stop her. And I did grab her by the throat, and I pinned her up against the wall. She just stabbed me in the chest. I'm bleeding like I stuck pain. The knife has fallen out of my chest. <clears throat> and I pinned her up against the wall. That was my impulse. I needed to stop her in some way. But of course, there are laws, and the law that in where I was, I was in the military at the time, I couldn't call the police because I would have gotten in trouble. I would have been the one get to get in trouble, not her. Because we were on a military reservation, I was a military member. So I would have gotten in trouble. Okay. Yes, sir. You have a question. I thought you were a zombie. I'm sorry? I thought you were a zombie. My, my, my wife. <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of do look like a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm sleeping, so, you know, I drool, you know, coming out of my mouth. It was clear, relatively clear. I assume it wasn't the black stuff that you normally see. Maybe out of zombies' mouths. Yeah, she probably thought I was a zombie, you're right. <laughs> Public safety is always a consideration in a civilized society. Uh, before laws, uh, people took matters into their own hands as vigilantes. And, of course, that's, if you watch old movies about the, the wild, wild west, uh, vigilantism, of course, is, is, uh, is something that we see, uh, that we have seen in the past. Now laws protect the public at every level, uh, so we don't really have to worry about it. You're, you're mostly protected. Okay. Uh, the changing of laws. Laws must be developed <laughs> and modified to keep up with rapid changes in our lives. Advances in neuroscience has, has changed how police investigate cases and how judges and juries these cases. Now we have DNA. So if we have 
a cell from a select individual, and we can isolate that cell. We can tell whose cell that is. Okay. Now this is really important if we're talking about rape, because semen has cells in it, and we can identify the DNA of the individual, of the individual whose semen that is. Does that prove that he raped somebody? If we know whose semen it is, it doesn't prove rape. It might have been consensual. That's a problem, isn't it? Okay. But we do have DNA. We can we can identify we can identify hair follicles. We can take the cells out of a hair follicle and we can identify DNA from the, from the hair follicles. Uh, if we have skin cells, uh, if we have saliva, there are cells in saliva. If we have a urine specimen, I don't know why we would have a urine specimen, but there are cells in urine specimens as well. So if we have skin, if we have hair, if we have blood, if we have semen, certainly if we have semen, we can identify whose cells those are, whose uh, body uh, uh, fluids or, or structures those are. We have brain imaging machines so that we can uh, read people's brains. Uh, we, we can see what's in the brain anyway. We can't really read their thoughts, but we can see what's, in, what's going on in their brain. Analysis of trace evidence, of course, and uh, uh, once upon a time uh, when, I was, when I first started working in, uh, in medicine, uh, we had to have large amounts of, of uh, material in order to determine uh, DNA or, or, or anything else. We needed a whole tube of blood. We needed seven cc's, which sounds like a whole lot. And in, the, in reality it is, because now we can take a single hair cell, we can take a single cell, if we can, uh, if, if it's still viable, we can break that down and find out what uh, the DNA structure is. So trace evidence now, uh, we can use trace evidence to uh, determine uh, lots of different interesting things. Uh, laws do to try to keep up with our changing times. Uh, legislators uh, must now consider uh, what restrictions should be placed on online activity. One of the things is, is uh, cyberbullying uh, is against the law in several states. Uh, so, and this is brand new. I mean, how old is the internet anyway? Well, it's 23 years old. 24 years old. I'm sorry. 1993. I'm 67. The internet is a lot younger than I am. It's actually younger than, no, not very many of you, okay. Anyway, okay. you're older than the internet is, if you're younger than 24 years old. So I was, how old was I when, when the internet was? Uh, 44, I was 44. 44, I know. I was 44 when the internet was invented. <laughs> Now you wonder why I'm, I'm a technophobe, why I just got my first cell phone. I have, I have one. It's not an iPhone like Sarah's. But it's a telephone. It works. My wife got it for me. As long as it works, right? I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, just, I got one here last year, you know, that flip phone I had. And it doesn't work any, any place except on the reservation. It's the only place it works. So people are calling me on the phone. Of course, I can't get it. I'm, I'm in New Mexico someplace. I can't get a telephone call. Or Texas, or Oklahoma, or Kansas. Or... Sexting! Oh, well, that's an odd idea, isn't it? Isn't that the strangest idea you've ever heard of? People sending you pictures of their naked bodies over the telephone. I don't even know how to get a picture on my telephone, so. <laughs> They were, they were making fun of me because I have a new telephone. They wanted to look at all the pictures I have on my telephone. You know, I do have a picture on my telephone. I can figure out which one yeah. That's a floor at my house in Iowa. <laughs> That's the only picture I have. <laughs> That's the whole album. That's all the albums. Okay. I would take a picture of the clock now. <clears throat> When I go to my class reunion, I'll take pictures of old, really old people. <laughs> you think I look old? Wait till you see the people that were in my class. I was actually a year younger than everybody that I graduated with, except one guy. There was one guy that was my age. Okay, turn out right, so. okay. Sexy seems like an odd thing. I had a friend uh, up on Fort Belknap. He was a cop, 
And <laughs> so he sends somebody a picture of, of his junk. <laughs> uh, I don't know why. He's a cop, but I don't know why he sent a picture of his junk to this, this lady that was out on a date with somebody else. <laughs> and, of course, the boyfriend found out, or maybe it was the, her husband. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, he got into all kinds of trouble for it. Sex. What? I think I know who you're talking about. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I love the guy. He's just, he's funny as all the other. Isn't he a great guy? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> really neat fellow. Anyways, sexting. Uh, of course, if you sext somebody who's underage, you've committed a crime. Right? If you send them an email with a picture of something that you shouldn't be showing them, uh, then this is a problem. Uh, we had a, um, a, a congressman from New York, Anthony Weiner, what a name, <laughs> who evidently showed pictures of his name. I don't know. Uh, anyway. <laughs> but he sent it to a 15-year-old girl, and now he's, of course, being indicted uh, for sexting uh, for... He's sexting an underage individual, and of course that's against the law. That's confusing as that. I don't understand any of this stuff. None of this makes any sense to me, because I'm really old. So, and I wish it existed back when I was overseas. <laughs> when I couldn't get a hold of anybody. I'm overseas. <laughs> my, my brother was over in Afghanistan in 2005, and he and his wife used to uh, email, Skype all the time. They Skype with each other all the time. I don't know if they were showing each other. Well, they're, they're married, who cares? Ugh. Ugh. Don't let <laughs> They're like in their 60s. <laughs> oh, what, a, what a horrible thought. Anyway, when I was overseas, we couldn't even telephone anybody. I mean, we, there was no internet, there was no email, there was none of that stuff. We had to write letters, and then it took like forever for, to get a letter back. My brother <laughs> my poor brother. My dad was the president of the uh, Red Cross in the United States at the time. My brother was overseas. He was over in Vietnam. And uh, he hadn't written for like a, six weeks. And my dad got upset and he, he thought he was dead. You know? so, he, uh, so he gets on the, the phone and he calls the army. My brother was in the army called the army and said, uh, I want my son to communicate with me. So, of course, this is the president of the Red Cross, and he's also a colonel in the, in the army, United States Army. So uh, they, you know, the, the message finally got down to his unit. His unit was out in combat. I mean, they were, they were, uh, they were in, a, in an isolated situation. And they sent a helicopter in and picked my brother up and took him back to base so that he could write a letter to my dad. And of course, when they when he, they tried to helicopter him back in, the unit had been wiped out. His squad was gone. So if my dad went away, I know my brother had a lot of survivor's remorse after that one, and he was pissed off at my dad. You know, he was in combat. He was fighting the whoever he was fighting, whatever he was fighting. Anyway, communication was great. But at least my dad got his letter, right? And he saved my brother's life, strangely enough. Uh, psychological approach, not that my brother wanted to have his life saved. That's the sad part. Psychological approach uh, to law emphasizes as human determinants with focus on individuals as its unit of analysis. Individuals are seen as responsible for their own conduct and as contributing to its causation. So the idea is that we have, we have uh, free will. And so we do what, what we want to do. And if we break the law, of course, and this is the, the way psychology has to view this, that we have voluntarily broken the law. And that's the way it, it is read. And that's the way it has to be read. Psychology examines the thoughts and actions of people involved in, in the legal system. Um, forensics is one thing. When we talk about uh, forensic psychology, it's one thing. But of course, we have to understand why uh, how criminals feel in the criminal justice system, how the police feel, how uh, judges feel, and how juries feel. We have to read all of this stuff. We have to understand who they are. 
And this is one of the reasons, was last night, Tuesday night? Bull was on last night. I don't know if any of you have watched Bull on television. It's not a very good television show. Uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, he is a, an individual that, uh, that reads juries. He, he, uh, uh, and he tries to predict what they're going to do. So he tries to select a jury uh, that will uh, be favorable to, favorable to his client. And of course, we can do that as psychologists. We potentially can do that. So reading a jury is very, very important or can be very important, which doesn't seem fair at all. Uh, we need to understand drug abusers. <clears throat> of course, this guy's got a, a wristband that has marijuana leaves on it and he's snorting something. I think he must be snorting cocaine, lines of cocaine. Anyway, drug abusers. Uh, petty thieves, why do they steal? Uh, sometimes uh, rich people steal. Yeah, kleptomaniacs. I had a, 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 a friend in college who was our discus thrower, and this guy was a kleptomaniac. He had all the money in the world. Actually, his father was fairly wealthy, and he had money, but he felt like he had to steal. I didn't understand it. Uh, he also had Huntington's disease, which is kind of interesting. I had a friend in, in, when I was in the service. He was our shortstop when I, I played softball. He was our shortstop. One time we were headed to, <laughs> this is in Germany, we were headed to uh, Amsterdam to play Schusterberg, uh, to play Schusterberg against, not the, not the Dutch, but it was, we had an Air Force base there. We were going to play against that team. And they stopped uh, on the uh, Audubon. Uh, we stopped at a store, and, uh, you know, he's, we're, it's the whole damn team in this, in this band. And what, so what does he do? He st steals a pair of sunglasses. He was a kleptomaniac. So we're, we're headed out of the place. We'd all gone to the bathroom. We'd all bought whatever we thought we needed to buy. Uh, and here he comes running out of the store uh, and jumps in the van and says, go, 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 go. <laughs> he had stolen the sunglasses. He saw that the, the, the guy that uh, owned the store had, had seen him. And the guy came out of the store and, of course, our coach, who was driving the van, started up real fast and took off. <laughs> what is that all about? Why did he do that? Well, he could have gotten all of us into trouble. In trouble, we were all colluding with him. By we were his, his uh, driving the escape vehicle. Anyway, he could have gotten us all in trouble. Very odd individual. Whoops, I went the wrong direction. Sorry. Okay. Police officers. This is a really serious situation right now because we have police officers that seem to be upset about something. And so they, they, they seem to be killing uh, unarmed individuals. And it's not, it seems to be happening just about every day. You hear about it almost every day. So a police officer has shot somebody who was unarmed. If they shoot an armed suspect, that's one thing. But here they're killing people that aren't, aren't armed aren't dangerous, haven't done anything. And who are the people that are being shot? They look like criminals, don't they? What is the aspect that makes them look like criminals? People of color. People of color. It especially happens to African Americans. I don't know if it's happening to Hispanics or not. We're not getting any information that it's happening to Hispanics. It may be happening to natives. I'm not exactly sure. I don't, we don't see that. But we see an awful lot of African Americans that are being blown away for no reason whatsoever. Who are unarmed. But it, you can imagine being a police officer. This is a really hard job. This is tough. You don't know if somebody is dangerous or not. Uh, you go to a domestic, you, you have a domestic disturbance call. The, um, my cousin, I had a cousin who was a cop in Indiana, in Indianapolis, and he got a domestic disturbance call. The lady was being beaten up by her boyfriend. So he knocked on the door, and uh, she opened the door, and he came in and uh, said, is everything okay, is everything okay? And the guy was behind the door and shot him in the back three times. <clears throat> And killed him. You can look it up. 
It's kind of kind of interesting. He's my cousin. Um, and he was trying to save this lady's life. But what did happen, because, uh, because the guy was shooting at him, the lady was able to, to escape out the back door. So he kind of saved her life in, a, in an interesting sort of way. He, he saved her life by, by being the target uh, of this, this individual. Uh, his name's Rodney. Rodney. I didn't really know him very well, so it's not that big a deal. So I'm sorry. 2012. He was killed in 2012. Uh, we need to understand the victims and uh, what they're thinking and how they're feeling. And how we can help them. We don't want them to be suffering from PTSD. We want to help them as much as we possibly can. The victims. The jur jurors, of course. What are they thinking? What's going on? <clears throat> uh, expert witnesses. <laughs> Guns for hire, as it were. Sometimes expert witnesses will, will say anything you want them to say. Uh, sometimes they actually are uh, expert witnesses, of course. Uh, corporate lawyers. Uh, a lot of um, uh, businesses cheat. They cheat on their taxes. They cheat, uh, they cheat the consumer. Um, a famous case would be uh, the automobile company companies that have a dangerous vehicle that don't do anything about it. The latest one that I can remember is General Motors. They had um, uh, the ignition on their on their cheaper cars, on their less expensive cars, not their Cadillacs, not their Oldsmobiles, not their Pontiacs, but on their Chevrolets and Saturns. Uh, the ignition was so delicate that you could be driving down the road and your car would turn off if you had, especially if you had any weight on that key. Uh, it would turn off the car. And they knew that this was, a, this was a problem. So what did they do about it? Nothing. It was too expensive to change. They thought it was too expensive to change. And of course, that was a couple of years ago. Uh, they had, Ford had the Pinto that had, uh, there was a little plastic piece uh, behind the gas tank. There was a little piece of, of, of plastic. Uh, and if you rammed a Pinto, it may burst into flame. It may rupture the gas tank and burst into flame because there was a post. This thing, this little plastic piece was on a post, and if that post, uh, if you, if it was rammed, that post would come into the, the gas tank. Of course, it was metal, so it would create a spark. And gasoline would would uh, would ignite, and the car would blow up because of this plastic piece. If they had made that piece out of anything more solid than plastic, then there there was no problem. But they saved like 56 cents on every pinto that they made. And they, they decided that, that it was more important to make that money, that 56 cents per car, than it was to change that piece and make it a safe car. And of course, they were taken to court and they lost. General Motors lost. And they lost billions of dollars because of, of, the, of the, the suit. Uh, the, uh, did, did the lawyers know? Uh, yeah, they knew. They knew. Once upon a time, I was in the military. I keep bragging about being in the military. Uh, at the time, AT&T was the only uh, telephone company in the United States. It was, well, there were other telephone companies, but it was the major telephone company. They had all the, the long distance lines. If you lived on a military base, then your telephone company was not AT&T, because AT&T didn't service any, uh, any military bases. So in order to call off the base, like, you know, soldiers want to do, uh, you had to call long distance. Everything off the base was long distance, even if you wanted to call the, the town right next to it. Which was a ripoff. And everybody knew it was a ripoff. The military knew it was a ripoff. Finally, somebody sued AT&T because of this. They were making just buku dollars off of military personnel because everything was long distance. Every time you made it a, a change from one telephone company to the next, it was another long distance charge. I had a, a bill of $1,200. My wife, my wife left me. She went up to Indiana. She kept calling collect. And I had a bill one month of $1,200. I was only making $4,800 a year. And I had a telephone bill of $1,200 uh, that I paid. I, I paid it. But uh, I'll tell you what. And it was all long-distance charges. 
Does anybody ever have $1,200 telephone bills? You probably, guys probably don't spend $1,200 on your telephone for a whole year. You do, okay. Sorry about that. You have $1,200 a month? About 600 was my highest oh, one month. That's yeah. not bad. It's crazy. Crazy. Somebody must have been in love. Stayed on the telephone all the time. It's usually the way it is. Yeah. This was, a, my wife was in hate with me, so she used to call me up at like 2 o'clock in the morning and say, I'm on a, out on a date with the hottest guy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, that's really exciting. I'm happy for you. That's what I would say. <laughs> oh, she was such a pleasant person. <laughs> uh, she was a mayor. Yeah, it's a, it's a female, of course. So think of her as a female <laughs> animal of one ilk or another. She was a mayor. Okay. <laughs> What a sweet, sweet lady. Judges. Oh, anyway, so oh, I was talking about corporate lawyers. I'm sorry, I didn't finish my story. So uh, AT&T got sued, um, and it took them 17 years to uh, settle the case. By that time, of course, the individuals that were had sued them were out of the military. All the individuals that had been screwed out of all that billions of dollars, long-distance charges, were now you know, someplace else. They were done. They have gone to the way the corporate lawyers had drugged this thing out for 17 years before it was finally settled out of court. Settled out of court, and that's uh, and the only reason it was settled out of court was because AT&T uh, was broken up at that time. So uh, otherwise, I mean, they had a monopoly on all the long distance lines. The first uh, other long distance line or long distance company in the United States was Sprint. I don't know if that's important. I just thought you might want to know since I've been around for that long. Judges, of course, uh, we try to read judges. Um, um, my family just had a court case where my daughter was fighting for the custody of her child and she was fighting for the right to leave the state of Florida. Since she gave birth to the child in Florida, the child is a resident of Florida. Uh, the father of the child, who never was extant, he could never lived with, with his child or with, his, with the mother of the child, uh, had sued um, my wife to keep the child in Florida. In which case, and he had never paid child support. <laughs> so once he took it to court, now all of a sudden he's got to pay all that back child support, which I think is just the funniest thing in the world. But we'll see what happens. Anyway, she doesn't need the money, she doesn't want the money. She just wanted to move up to Iowa. So this, and, and this was just settled like a couple of weeks ago, uh, that she could actually move up to Iowa. But we had to read the judge. We had to try to figure out what the judge was thinking, uh, how logical this was. And, and of course, she won her case. So now my, my daughter and my grandson are living in Iowa rather than Florida. Why would somebody want to live in Iowa? I mean, Florida's like paradise, isn't it? Is it Florida paradise? Isn't it wonderful? Is it the most crowded state in the United States? Yes. Yeah, they have Flocka. I'm sorry? <clears throat> yeah, they have Flocka. They have what? Flocka. Flocka. Oh, Flocka. I forgot all about the Flocka. You remember the Flocka? Yeah. Flocka. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so why would somebody want to move to Iowa? <laughs> Turns out Iowa is the fifth best place to raise a child in the United States. I know. I know. It's the fifth best place. Guess what is the worst thing to raise a child? New Mexico. How did you know? Yeah, it really is. Guess who's number 49? Who's 49? Who's 49? New Mexico is 50. New Mexico is 50. The worst place in the United States to raise a child. What's the second worst place to raise a child in the United States? Arizona. It's 49. Sorry about that. I, I didn't make it up. I was number five. Florida's like 38th or something like that. Best place to raise a child. Anyway. Uh, defendants. We need to understand that uh, we try to read uh, defendants as well. Who else are we reading? Prison guards, because sometimes they're abusive. And we've seen this over and over and over again. 
Sometimes they have sex with their inmates, with the inmates. It's one of the reasons why we try to separate the sexes. Of course, that doesn't mean they're not going to have sex, but uh, we certainly don't want male guards at a female prison. We have them anyway, but it's, it's really not a very good idea. Parole officers, the toughest job in the world. People that are out on parole, if they're, if they're still doing something wrong, they will lie to you. They don't always tell you the truth. There's, there's a shot for you. You can imagine how callous these individuals become. Because everybody, a lot of people will lie to them. And they know that. And they have to read people. So this is a really, really tough job, being a parole officer. Uh, psychology assumes that characteristics of, of uh, participants in the legal system affect how the legal system operates, and it also recognizes that the law, in turn, can affect individuals' characteristics and behaviors. Uh, this was tough because uh, we have never gone to court before. My family has never gone to court before. And my daughter is sitting there, and she's telling the truth. And then her uh, baby daddy, that's a isn't that a good word? Is that okay? Her baby daddy got on the stand and he just lied his ass off. I mean, he hardly said anything that was true. He was saying how his family is supporting, has loves the child and spends a lot of time with the child. They don't spend any time with the child. I had to travel 1,300 miles to go to Florida. I spent more job time with the child than they did. If, uh, if she had a babysitting problem, my wife went down to take care of it. And of course, they're, oh no, my family's always there for it. He lied his ass off. So, yeah, that was kind of interesting. And my daughter said, hey, if I knew you could lie, you know, she took me up. <laughs> if I knew I could have lied, wow, I could have made him look really, really bad. But uh, we're not very good at lying. We're not, really, we're not real bright either. Dumbest family in the world. We're honest. What could be worse than being honest? <laughs> Characteristics in this case represent abilities, perspectives, values, and experiences, of course. And you can imagine how hard it is to be a policeman. You run into jackasses over and over and over and over again. You're not used to dealing with normal people, with people that aren't drunk, with people that aren't stoned, with people that aren't lying to you. So you assume, as a police officer, the longer you're a police officer, you have a hard time telling what the truth is, understanding what the truth is, because everybody lies to you. I would lie to them if they stopped me and said, how fast do you think you were going? I would take a couple of miles off. I know how fast I'm going. I've got it on cruise control. It says right there I was going 82 miles an hour. Am I going to say that to the policeman? I think I was speeding. <laughs> I may, might say something stupid like, I think my speedometer's broken. Is it going too fast? What, what, did, you, what did you clock me at? Maybe my, my speedometer's broken. I might do that. I, here my daughter tell, always tells the truth. I, I think it's, it's okay if you lie when you're driving a car, right? If you get stopped by the police. I got stopped in Montana one time for not stopping at a stop sign. I was pulling onto a to two. I was pulling onto two. And they stopped me for uh, not stopping at the stop sign. And he stopped me down the road a little bit. And uh, he thought I was, na this is one, the time they thought I was native. Because I had bell, bell net plates. I had uh, a dream catcher. You can't, you can't tell if somebody, especially in that little sports car. And the first thing he asked me was, um, first thing he asked me was, what were you doing down that road, on that road? Are there certain roads I can't, I can, can't drive on? This is, this is what was going on. He thought I was a native. And, he, <coughs> and there were only white people that lived on that road. I lived on that road. <coughs> and I said, well, I lived down there. And he looked at me and said, oh, 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 okay, okay. Then you didn't stop at that stop sign. <laughs> But I know the sheriff from, from uh, uh, Blaine County. I know the sheriff from Blaine County. And I talked to him later about this guy. And he said, ah, yeah, he's always, he's, he's, uh, uh, always stopping people he shouldn't be stopping. Yeah, he stopped somebody he shouldn't have been stopping. Exactly. Anyway, stopped and he thought I was a native. 
No offense to natives, of course, except he was fairly offensive. Characteristics determine whether a defendant uh, and their lawyer will accept a plea bargain or go to trial. And as we're going to find out, in most trials, there are some, uh, most cases are settled as plea bargains. They don't go to trial. It's a lot easier, it's cheaper, uh, so most, uh, most uh, legal cases are plea bargains. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, when my daughter went to, to talk to the lawyer about the custody case, this is one of the things uh, that they were talking about. Uh, her, the baby daddy's lawyer, uh, always went to trial. He would always take these things to trial. You can mediate these things, uh, but uh, he always took it to trial. So we were worried that it was going to cost us, you know, piles and piles and piles of money. So we borrowed like $10,000 to uh, make sure that my daughter had the support that she needed. Uh, we haven't spent any of it yet. Actually, we've it's, it's cost us about $5,000 and we were able to, I got $5,000 right here in my pocket. No, I got three dollars. <laughs> oh, that's a 10. Oh, I got $12. <laughs> oh, $13, it's getting better. Okay, I got $13. We have we have the money. Yeah, and they, you, they pay me so well here that I've got. An extra five thou just hanging around. Characteristics determine uh, whether a Hispanic juror will be more sympathetic toward a Hispanic defendant than toward a non-Hispanic defendant. And of course, as I was saying uh, in, in the last class, uh, you never know. Uh, there was a black guy that was at the uh, Trump rally last night. He was right behind Trump. It's the oddest thing I've ever seen. What the hell are you doing there? He kept yelling at the guy, get out of there. You don't. Trump's a racist. Get away from it. What are you doing? But just because you are the same race as somebody else doesn't mean that you're going to be nice to that guy. Or you're going to like your own people. Some people don't like their own people. So just because you're Hispanic doesn't mean you're going to uh, support the Hispanic defendant. Characteristics determine whether a juvenile offender will uh, fare better in a residential treatment facility or a correctional institution. Usually what we will do is send them to a residential treatment facility. Initially, and if we have to send them back, we'll probably do it twice, and we may even do it a third time. But three strikes are just about as many as you're going to get the next time you get to go to to jail. And unfortunately, uh, jails do not rehabilitate, even if you're a juvenile. Unfortunately, it's really kind of tragic. Please don't cry. Uh, the setting within which the individual operates is important as well. Uh, the social scientist Kurt Lewin proposed the equation B equal F. I'm sorry, I, don't, I can't do equation. To reflect the idea that behavior is a function of the person and the environment. So we take all of these things into account. They've created this equation. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's simple math. It's simple math. Behavior of persons in legal systems can also be viewed as a function of both the person and the environment. So the question is: Is it the is it the person or is it the environment? Which one is the bad guy? What is what is worse, the environment or the person? The environment. Is it the environment? <clears throat> okay. All right. Sometimes the environment is bad. So we can't send anybody to jail because well, it's the environment's fault, right? So how do we take care of the situation? We have to protect society. So how do we protect society if the environment is bad? And we know that there are bad environments all over the place. Uh, evidently, Pinyon was pretty bad well, when the, before they busted everybody for crystal meth. Is that what was going on a couple of years ago? Last year? It was last year. Kevin came to class and told us about what was going on in Pinyon. And it wasn't very long after that that they had that huge raid that they took all, those, all the bad guys out of Pinyon. Right? I'm mispronouncing the name. Yeah. Right, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> At least you didn't correct me this time. When you were sitting over here, you used to, I'd say pinyon, and you'd go, no, no, it's pinyon. <laughs> yes, the environment is sometimes the problem. If you live in Detroit, for example, a lot of violence going on in Detroit. Uh, south, uh, south central LA, uh, a lot of violence in that area. Uh, is there a er bad area of Phoenix? Does Phoenix have a, an area? Southside. What? Where is it? Southside, and also along the avenues. Along the avenue. 
That's where I was last year. I was along the avenue, I think. Any of the avenues. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. Okay, I'll remember that. Thanks for the, the, the heads up. I won't go to the south side, and I'll, I'll stay off the avenue. Okay. Uh, Denver, how about Denver? Oh, what's that one street, that horrible street in Denver? My son used to tend a bar on, on that street. They used to get drunks and then potheads used to come in. And if people that are smoking pot drink alcohol, it knocks them out. They go to sleep. What, 16th Street? 16th? No, it's not 16th. It's got a name. It starts with an F. I can't remember. Okay. Does Chinley have a vet? No. It's only one street. <laughs> Well, it's two. You go this way, and then you go three. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say Saley. I don't even know if Saley. I guess we've got the gas station, and that's about it, right? The teacher housing. <laughs> I heard a lot of horrible stuff. <laughs> okay, so the environment can be bad. <laughs> How about Tuba City? No? Yes? Yeah, south side. Is there south side? It's always the south side. Why is that? They used to call it being on the other side of the tracks. The south side. South side of in Denver, of course, it's that one street that goes right down the middle of the town. Colfax? Colfax. It's Colfax, that's what it is. Thank you. I knew it had an F in it someplace. Okay, Colfax. <laughs> A prosecuting attorney may recommend a harsher sentence for a convicted felon if the case has been highly publicized, the community is outraged over the crime, and the prosecutor happens to be waging a re-election campaign. Now, this doesn't sound fair, does it? Just because all of these things are in place, he's going to give you, he's going to send you uh, up the river for 50 years instead of 25. So now instead of being paroled after 10 years, now you're not going to be able to be paroled until you've been there for 30 years. Just because he's in a re-election. That doesn't seem fair, does it? But that's the way it works. I know, politics. It's ugly, isn't it? And of course, if everybody's pissed off about it. Uh, we've got a case in, New in Albuquerque uh, where they, they uh, killed the 10-year-old, the, the raped and killed the 10-year-old, and then tried to dismember her. There's the three people. The mother, the cousin of the guy, wasn't it the cousin of the guy? And then the guy, of course. He was the one that raped. She, he and she both raped the child, I guess, as ugly as that is. So yeah, everybody's a, a little upset about that. So the community is outraged. The whole state of New Mexico and this side of Arizona is pretty outraged, outraged about this. This is national news. Everybody in the United States knows about this case. Everybody in the United States is really upset about this whole thing. So how in the world can any of those three get a good, uh, get a fair trial? What do we know about the mother? Is she going to get off because she was the mother? Isn't she the one that advertised for somebody to come and rape her daughter? So I'm guessing the book will be thrown at least three times. Uh, as far as this case is concerned, but you know, this is this is a very very highly publicized case. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I was I was asking you about the kid in Ganado. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. they found a, a headless body. It was a child. Infant. An infant. We don't know. We don't know anything about it. We haven't heard anything. Of course, it's the FBI. They never they never talk about anything. A juror holding out for a guilty verdict may yield if all the other jurors passionately proclaim the defendant's innocence. <clears throat> that's a possibility. Uh, and we do know that that's the case. Uh, a lot of pressure if you're in with this group of individuals. And you know that the only way you're going to get out of that room is by everybody agreeing on what's, what's going on. So what's the probability you're going to say, no, nah, you know, this, the food that they're serving us is really good. My bed is better than the one at home. So I think I'm going to prolong this thing as long as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. That's not usually the way it works. Usually pressure from the rest of the group will pressure that individual uh, to, uh, uh, to cave and to, uh, to allow it to, uh, to go through. 
Um, a, a recent case, Bill Cosby case, the Bill Cosby case. I mean, who could have predicted that Bill Cosby drugged and raped a number of women? I mean, that's really kind of odd, but he has, they, they've just gone to trial, and now he's going to go to trial again. They had, a, they had a hung jury. They couldn't make a decision. So now they're going to have another trial. And of course, he has new lawyers, and I don't know what's going to happen next. Really shocking, isn't it? If you think of, you know, the, he was everybody's dad. You know, Bill Cosby on television. He was Mr. Huxtable, Dr. Huxtable. Juvenile offender may des desist from criminal behavior if his gang affiliations are severed. And we see this all the time. Uh, you need to separate the, those individuals. And if we can get that him away or her away from that group for an extended length of time, like sending them to prison, uh, then a lot of times they won't go back to the gang. It's just like somebody leaving the reservation. If somebody leaves the reservation and then tries to come back, are they accepted by everybody as, as if they had never been gone? It's not usually the way it works. The gangs are the same way. They are a big family. And if somebody has left, they can't go back. It's kind of the reason that I don't go home and party down with my, with my uh, brothers and sisters. I've been everywhere, and I've done lots and lots of stuff, and I know a lot of things that my brothers and sisters have never even imagined. <laughs> so I can't go home. I can have a, a conversation for an hour or two hours, but after that, we just don't have anything in common. My brother wants to talk about Delaware County, Muncie, Indiana, and I, don't, I haven't been there since I was 17 years old. I can't go home. I can go home for a day, maybe. I'm going to go back to my reunion. I don't know anything about Daleville. That's where I graduated from high school. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be fascinating. I'll tell you all the stories after I come back. I promise I'll tell you all my stories. <laughs> One of the interesting things is I graduated, I, I told some of you, I graduated in class of 72 and 11 people have died. And so the first thing we're go they're going to do is they're going to light candles for all the Dead people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't care about any of these people. They're going to light candles, and they're going to tell the story of how they, how they died or why they died. Or, I know. Well, kind of gro gross, isn't it? It's like Bryant and his zombies back there. <laughs> died of emphysema. Suffered for three years. Oh, boy. This is a good one. <laughs> Had a heart attack. Two of the people committed suicide. So that ought to be interesting. You know? One of them went out to, uh, <laughs> he went out to uh, the Redwoods. You know the Redwood that you could park, you could drive through? He parked in, in there and he killed himself. I know. And after that, they closed it after he committed suicide. I know. My friend is the one that closed that road going through the, the Redwood. What a jackass. Okay. I'm sorry? That tree fell. Oh, it fell? Oh, it's fallen now. Okay. That's tragic. <laughs> anyway. And I miss it. I, I, have to, I have to miss the first day when they talk about all the dead people. Rats. <laughs> we are all active uh, participants in the legal system. Uh, we're, we all face daily choices to follow or break the law. Uh, speeding exact for, is, is a good example. How many people don't speed? How many people never drive over the speed limit? What the hell is the speed limit? Johnny, okay, good for you. <laughs> what is the speed limit on the reservation? 55. 55. So how fast can I go without being picked up by the Navajo Tribal Police? 75. 75? <laughs> 85? They drive just as fast. As long as you wave. I drive. <laughs> Put a hand up. I mean, going here to Gallup, you know, I, I get passed by like everybody, and I'm going 62 miles an hour. I always, that's seven miles an hour. That's not too bad. <clears throat> I and think it's eight miles per hour if you go eight miles. 63? I can go yeah, 63. Yeah, you can go 63. Okay. You can go one more. Uh, okay, I, I'm lying. Sometimes when I'm coming back from Gallup, I'll drive 65. But I can go 85? 
I went 85 down to 10 <laughs> years <laughs> here, and when I went, I got stopped at 85. That's the only time I got stopped. <laughs> And I said my socks were too heavy, that's what I was going Your through. socks were too heavy. <laughs> See, up north that would have worked. <laughs> Not down here. Okay, so how fast can I go? Come on, you guys. Give me, give me the straight skinny on how fast I go. 70. 70? Okay, I got a 70. You know, five miles over like 60. That's 60. That's 60. So you're saying 60. She's saying 70. I'm going to go with her. I agree. Is there a difference between being a male and a female? Do they stop males more readily than they stop females? Let's experiment. Give you a warning now. That's not fair. Okay. Uh, Maybe speeding. you just gotta okay. be told that. Just kidding. <laughs> if you see somebody shoplifting, you're gonna you're gonna rat them out to the uh, the owner. Go to Bosch's. See somebody somebody eating a cupcake. <laughs> I see kids do that all the time yeah. at the store. And you rat them out every time. No, I, I, I want to do what they're doing, you know, because they can pick anything up and just start eating it, you know. And by the end of the trip, or the shopping trip, they're all done with it, so. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Free snacks at Bosch's. This is great news. Whether to vote to change a law such as the legalization of marijuana, this is, uh, actually, they voted on marijuana in this state, uh, legalizing marijuana, and it, 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 uh, it lost. It wasn't, it's not legal here. To recreational marijuana. Uh, Ain't it on the ballot for the tribe? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's it going to be on the ballot for the tribe. For the tribe. So it could be legal on this reservation. Well, that would be. Boxes. Okay. Will it pass? They haven't have it yet. They're, it's, um, they're, what do you, it has to pass the legislation before it reaches the ballot. Oh, so okay. if it passes that, then it'll be on the ballot. Okay, well that would be interesting. Let's watch. Let's I know that. that there is medical marijuana in the state of Arizona, but only people with a card can use that. And they have, like, stores, the, what are they called? Uh, medical the marijuana? pharmacies. Yeah, the pharmacies for that in, in the state of Arizona. Okay. And I know some clinics and hospitals offer that as well. They have their own pharmacies, like their own department. So you can blaze up and I guess so. I don't know. I'm going to have a card for it, a medical reason. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is say you've got, a, you've got migraines or back problems. They, it's not like they can draw your blood and find out if you have a back problem. <laughs> That's what happened in Montana. You know, they thought that they were only going to have four or 5,000 people and with med medical marijuana. Doctors came in and they were approving everything. And there's like 50, 60,000 people in Montana. There, there's only 900,000 people in Montana. It's actually losing people. Why don't we stop right here? We'll pick this up next time. As fascinating as all this is. Uh, okay. Does anybody have any questions about what we need to do to pass the class or how we're going to do this? Any questions? Yes.